Go for it whenever you're ready. Yeah. Um, hello. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kofi, uh, and this talk is um, it's it's kind of a, a collection of things I observed through learning Elm, um, which is a, a functional, strongly typed language for for front end programming. Um, can I see actually show hands who knows Elm or uses Elm? Nice, cool. <laughs> yeah, this will be dope. Um, so there's no uh, no prior experience with Elm necessary. Um, in fact, if you do know Elm, uh, forgive me for some of the simplifications. There are only a couple, um, but uh, but I think it'll be a good time. So let's uh, let's get started. So I work for Eighth Light. It's a consultancy. They don't, they didn't sponsor the meetup, but they sponsor me. So um, so I'll say a few words. Uh, we we write custom software. Um, and uh, design as well. We do um, project management consulting as well as agile training as well. So um, we're, we're, we're new to Denver and, and, uh, and look for clients. So if you're looking for folks in that space, um, let me know. So uh, let's start with how I got interested in Elm. Uh, and so I, I, I started, I, I got to Elm by way of Swift. Um, do we have any Swift developers here? Oh, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, um, so uh, so if you if you've heard any of the marketing for Swift, um, Apple's documentation, it's like Swift is a safe language. That's like the big word that they like to use for it because compared to um, C type languages, it is it is super safe. Um, and that appealed to me. I wanted a language that made it really really hard for me or just developers in general to make um, uh, mistakes that are not. Uh, Kind of inherent to the to the problem domain, right? So it, it's fine if a language you know lets me mess up business requirements. I just wanted a language that wouldn't let me, um, you know, blow up my program at runtime. Uh, that seems reasonable. Um, so I learned Swift and I was enjoying it. Um, so I'll show you a little bit of Swift. Uh, so here we're making an array. Let is how you define constants in Swift, and so A is a constant array. We're going to access it using two, um, but this array that's a uh, index out of bounds, and this actually fails at runtime in Swift, um, which is which is kind of a big bummer because uh, uh, Swift has this idea of optional return types. Um, so you can, you can say that a function might not return something and handle it um, at compile time. And it also has the idea of exceptions. But for some reason, um, I mean, I know the reason for, for efficiency so that you don't have to, so that the developers don't check, so that the, um, the runtime doesn't check every time. Swift chooses uh, that array indexing is just, is just unsafe. In nature, and you should you should be using higher order functions to access your arrays. So um, uh, that was kind of a bummer to me, though, because uh, I I feel that array uh, indexing is um, a a pretty a, a thing you come across pretty soon when you're learning a language, and I, I didn't like that it was very easy for for programs to crash. And um, so I listened intently uh, when my coworker. Um, claimed that Elm had, had no uh, crashes and runtime exceptions. Um, and that's not, if you, you know, if you really get into it, it's not entirely true. Um, there are ways to crash your program. Um, uh, but it's a lot, it's a lot uh, less difficult, which, uh, which was really nice. So um, I'll show you a little bit of Elm. Um, this is how we define a record, it's called in Elm. It's, it's pretty close to a JavaScript object. Um, Place so meetup meetup is a constant. Uh, everything in Elm is a constant, so uh, so you don't need letter var. Um, but uh, meetup is a constant. So meetup dot place is a string. Meetup dot time is uh, an int, and then meetup dot topic is a maybe. And uh, a maybe is how we define um, optionality in Elm. So meetup dot type could be nothing, um, or it could be uh, it could be something. There could be something inside of that of that type. So the type is a maybe. But there are two constructors for that type, and those constructors are nothing, which takes no parameters because it's just uh, it's kind of how we define null. Elm doesn't have the concept of null or undefined. Um, everything is baked into the type system, so it's either going to be nothing, or you do just, and then the, the parameter is whatever value you're going to wrap up. Um, so let's look at a a function definition. Uh, the function is called add meetup, and it takes one parameter, uh, which is calendar. The colon colon operator is how we append, uh, uh, I guess prepend to the front of a list. Um, and so what's, uh, what, what might be different about this than JavaScript is that uh, all values in Elm are immutable. 
right? So we're actually returning a new list. Elm um, doesn't have a way for you to modify an existing list. Instead, your functions just um, return return a new list. So we return a new list. The calendar value that we pass in, that is a list, that remains unchanged. Um, we're just returning a list with now the meetup that we just defined um, uh, at, the, at the front of it. So uh, that, that idea of um, immutability by default is really cool, I think. Um, and it was, it was fairly easy for me to understand coming from Swift because uh, Swift has the notion of traditional object-oriented classes um, that, uh, that, that use mutation whenever they want. Um, but it also has uh, value types, uh, so structs and enums in Swift. Um, are immutable and they can't change. So um, a, a, a good example is Swift's array type. Um, so the array type itself is immutable, which means if you if you declare it as let, then you can actually never change that that variable that you defined or the contents uh, there. But if you uh, declare it as var, there are special mutating functions that you can use on anything that you've declared as variable. And so we can call b.append because we declared b as var even though a is a constant, um, and then at the end, a is not equal to b. It's as if whenever you uh, declare something as var, it copies uh, whatever value it's, it's referencing. Right? So let is a constant, and even though uh, it might look like they're pointing to the same array on that second line, uh, they're, they're, they're not really. Um, uh, it just, it just uh, we use var, var to declare things that can change. So, um, so looking back one level under under Swift's array type, we'll find this comment in the actual source code. Um, so all that's Im important is, is in blue. Uh, Swift uses a copy on write optimization, um, which means that uh, even though the array itself, the array is defined as a struct, um, which means it's an immutable value in Swift, uh, the, the, the B and A are actually pointing to the same spot in memory until you call b.append. So until you go to change a uh, mutable value in Swift, um, it, can, it can perform as if it's accessing the same memory. So that allows you, so if you, if you declare a bunch of variable arrays, Swift isn't just going to copy as many arrays as you declare until you need to change them all. Um, and that's an optimization that it makes. And it's, it's cool because you, that's all in Swift. Um, so if you, if you just look in the array source code, you go to array.swift, um, then you'll see that, um, that even though it's declared as a struct, it uses uh, mutable mechanisms inside. And so the struct, the, the immutable presentation of the object is kind of just the interface. So it gives you the convenience of um, uh, uh, understanding your code in terms of immutability, but, um, but the performance benefits of, uh, of using mutation under the hood. Um, so, so does that make sense so far? Did, uh, does anyone have any questions about how Swift is working? Cool, cool. All right, so, um, uh, so that's really cool. Uh, so let's uh, go back to Elm. This is the update function. If you're familiar, do you have folks that are familiar with um, uh, Redux? Redux? Cool, uh, nice, it's a lot. Um, so, uh, so, so Redux is inspired by the Elm architecture, um, and, and you can you you can kind of mentally swap out um, whenever I say message with um, uh, what's it called action, and then uh, model with store or state. Um, so, if you've ever looked inside the Redux source code, um, it's uh, it's a it's a pretty simple idea at its core, um, in that it kind of just says give me give me your your, the state, the thing you want me to manage, and then please don't change it. If you need to change it, observe, observe it through the APIs that I'm giving you. Um, and it's, it's all implemented in JavaScript, uh, Redux is JavaScript library, and so it's, it's all implemented in JavaScript. It's not like it goes down to some uh, uh, web assembly or something to, to do this thing. It's just an abstraction that, that they're providing. Um, so in Elm, uh, I, I forgot to mention, sorry, the, the colon and the arrows, this just means it's a, we're looking at a type signature, not um, not an actual function. So we're just looking at the function called update that has two parameters, the message and the model. Um, and then it returns something that is the same type of the second parameter, which is the model. So it's, it's a way that you take a message and a model and apply that message to your model to get a new model. Um, and uh, you, so you write this function yourself when you're developing Elm. And then you, in your main function, when you're calling 
when you're making an Elm program, you, you provide the function to Elm, and then Elm kind of manages the state on your behalf. Um, so uh, let's, let's kind of do the same thing we did with Swift. Let's peel back one layer to see how Elm kind of does that for us. Um, and this is what you find if you go a layer deep, which is, um, so program is the name of the function in Elm that you're calling to start your program. Um, and your update function is going to be inside of, I did have to shorten the names, so the names aren't this terse, but uh, Fs is functions, and uh, so your, your update function is going to be inside of there. Um, and so this program actually just, this, this function just delegates to another function, which is in the module uh, native.virtual.dom. Um, so that uh, looks, looks a bit suspicious, so let's peel back actually another layer and see how Elm manages state. Um, and uh, this is the actual, you know, with a shortened name, uh, this is the actual implementation of that function we just saw. Um, and so you, so you might be thinking, um, where am I? How do we get here? Uh, you know, where do we go wrong? Because we were looking at Elm, which is a really nice language. Um, and, then, and then now we're looking at JavaScript, you know, which is JavaScript. And so um, <laughs> it, uh, it, it, it should concern you, I think. Uh, uh, it shouldn't su surprise you ultimately, right? Because uh, because I told you Elm is a front end language, and you know we we, we just we just run front, uh, JavaScript on the front end, and so it shouldn't surprise you that Elm is ultimately implemented in JavaScript. Um, but uh, but but if we're remembering how we got here, we just kind of wanted to see how Elm was was managing state for us, um, which uh, in in React's case is is relatively simple. It's just an abstraction over um, over a stateful API and. Swift's case, it's the same thing. An array is an abstraction over a stateful API. Um, but, uh, and, and so with Swift, we had the option to write stateful code. Um, but the preference is just uh, that you're writing code that is immutable. But Elm, Elm takes a very different approach, um, which is, uh, is, is kind of the key observation of this that drives this presentation, which is that you, you can't do anything stateful in, in Elm itself. Um, so, so Elm actually has no syntax for updating a, a field on a record, right? There's just no, you can't type it out in Elm because there's, there's no uh, combination of characters that would allow you to change anything in Elm. Uh, everything is an, an immutable value when you assign it, and functions um, can't change the value of anything that they take in, uh, which means that you're, you're always having to return a new version if you want to uh, return the same kind of thing. And so at the, at the language level itself, there's no idea of, uh, of state or mutability. Um, which means that the only way to change state, because our web apps do need to carry state in order for us to um, have any useful interactions with the user, and the only way to do it is actually to write that part of your program in JavaScript. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, I guess the, the caveat is most of the, lang most of the, uh, the features that you need to develop a web app are already developed in JavaScript libraries that you can use, um, like uh, interacting with the DOM or making HTTP requests. Um, there are already standard Elm libraries that do this in JavaScript, um, so you can use their abstractions in Elm. So you don't have to necessarily write JavaScript in order to deal with these things. But the language itself doesn't have the capacity to interact um, statefully. Um, so I think a, a reasonable suspicion at this point might be that um, well, uh, Kofi, you said um, you said you can't do anything mutable in, in Elm, but then you said you have to use JavaScript, and then you said Elm compiles to JavaScript. So, uh, you know, how do those how do those play together? If you're compiling to JavaScript anyway, then then aren't you already getting the benefit of having the mutable language? And I think the the the, uh, uh, the second key observation is that Elm actually uses JavaScript as a language for two purposes. Um, and, and that is JavaScript is Elm's compile target, but it's also uh, the language that Elm uses to manage effects. Um, and so uh, let's talk a bit about the compile target first. Um, that's a little bit easier. So Elm compiles to stateless JavaScript. Um, so that, that means that any function that you're writing in pure Elm, um, you're, you're only allowed to take in, in the JavaScript that, that you get out of it will only just be taking in values and, and returning new versions. You, you can't change anything that's compiled straight from Elm will never change the values that you're passing in or interact with any globals because the language doesn't have that capacity and so that translates 
into the compiled uh, code you get out of it. Um, so as, as long as you uh, stay in Elm, as long as you're, you're coding in Elm, then you, get, you can make really cool guarantees, um, which is that all of your functions kind of will have no direct impact on um, the environment that your program is running in, because Elm doesn't have any way to access the environment. It's, it's just through these standardized JavaScript interfaces. Um, but also you get the, the type checking that comes, um, that, that I mentioned at the beginning, right? So Elm is a, a strongly typed language, and so the compiler can check your, your types um, in, in a very uh, safe and exhaustive way um, because it, it can make guarantees about how your functions exist. Um, so this is the, the maybe type that we looked at earlier. I told you maybe had two constructors, and the maybe is actually implemented in pure Elm. So, uh, so it's not as if maybe just compiles to null or undefined in JavaScript. Uh, maybe is actually a, a full Elm type, and so it compiles to, to a normal Elm with, with these two constructors. And um, this is just how we define that maybe has, uh, is a type that can, it can wrap anything, which is A, and then it has the, the two constructors are, you can either construct it with just, which takes that, that anything, or nothing, um, which, which represents optionality. Um, and so, since it's written in pure Elm, it means that there's no way to modify a maybe uh, unless you write JavaScript and uh, ask your compiler to you know, unsafely compile your JavaScript in with your Elm. Um, so the language just doesn't allow you to change a maybe because it's implemented in pure Elm, which means it has no mechanism, there's no syntax for you to, for you to change it. Um, so, uh, so, so now thinking about the effects management, which is a little, a little bit trickier. Um, the, the, the Elm compiler treats modules that are marked as native uh, a little differently. And, and you do have to turn this on in your compiler, so you can't, you can't do it by accident, which is, which is nice. Um, but uh, we saw that the, the program function was implemented as native.virtual.program. And it was marked native because uh, native just means that um, there's a folder in your Elm app that contains JavaScript, and um, the compiler doesn't do any type checking on JavaScript that you write. Uh, it just kind of sticks your JavaScript into the compiled source that it, that it gives you at the end. Um, but you have, so you'd have to explicitly turn it on. Um, and there are other ways, there are safer ways to interact with JavaScript if you're actually um, writing an LMAP. Uh, so uh, the native functionality is mostly for folks who are intentionally writing these, uh, these like side effect APIs like HTTP requests or modifying the DOM. Um, so those are mostly for library authors. If you're building a web app, you usually don't turn on native modules in your, in your compiler. Um, uh, because it's pretty easy to shoot yourself in the foot because you lose all of the type checking, uh, which is uh, where a lot of the benefits of Elm derive from. Um, so I, I've used this word effects a couple times. I think Richard Feldman has a, a really good definition of it. Um, he spoke at some React comp and was talking about Elm. Uh, I guess, like I'm doing, not talking about React, talking about Elm. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so it goes, <laughs> effects are interactions with external state. Um, so that's why I think the DOM and AJAX requests are, uh, are good examples, but uh, also local storage, right? And so um, a, any function that interacts with those kinds of things uh, means that you lose certain guarantees, right? You lose, the, for instance, if you, um, only put a success handler on your HTTP request, like you, you might never uh, get notified uh, of, that, of that request finishing. Um, and so anytime that the, the compiler can't control um, whether or not you're doing something correctly, it kind of just uh, delegates it to JavaScript and say, if you're gonna do it in JavaScript, do it in JavaScript, and, uh, and you know, have the, have the time of your life. Um, so, so this is my mental model of how uh, the Elm compiler works. The Elm compiler is the blue thing in the middle. It's just a, it's that arrow. It's a greater than sign. Um, and so it takes your Elm source code and your native modules, which are JavaScript effects, and that includes if you're using any library that's using native modules. And then it and it take and it uh, knows the Elm compiler knows the process by which to mix them and give you JavaScript as an output. Um, and what's what's neat and interesting about this model. Uh, is that it means that the, the, the JavaScript effect piece of the diagram could actually um, literally be anything. It could be any language as long as the Elm compiler knows 
how to take that and translate it into something that can run on the web, um, Elm could choose to use Python to describe its effects. Um, it doesn't, and I, I, it's a convenience because a lot of these web APIs are written in JavaScript. Um, uh, but, but in theory, right, it, it, it could be anything. Um, and so uh, this guy, Wheatbread on Twitter, um, uh, described it this way. I mean, not Twitter, Reddit. Sorry. Uh, Elm has a DSL, uh, domain-specific language for uh, scripting effects, and that language is called JavaScript. Um, and so uh, I found this on Reddit, and I tweeted it, and I thought it was really cool. I was like, oh, nice, Wheatbread had a really good idea. Um, and, it, and it turns out that Wheatbread is uh, the alias of Evan, the author of Elm. So like, <laughs> my observation that he had a good observation about his own language is not a great observation. Um, uh, but the, the point is that uh, as long as the compiler knows how to, how to do the mapping between the uh, effect DSL and the compile target, then, then the effect DSL can, can be whatever. Um, and so uh, this is uh, the title slide. And um, uh, if you're paying close attention, you may have noticed I haven't talked about this at all. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, Elm has actually formally moved away from uh, the, the functional reactive programming um, title. Um, and so uh, this talk actually is, is more accurately noted as uh, the comma that's in between functional and reactive. Um, and that is, this talk is just about, it's about programming that is, that is functional and reactive. Functional reactive programming is, is, um, uh, is actually a pretty formally defined thing where you're interacting with uh, effects mainly time in a way that, um, that doesn't lose any of the uh, precision that a continuous timeline grants you. Uh, but I'm not really talking about that. I'm, I am talking about a piece um, of functional reactive programming, uh, and that is uh, managed effects. So, uh, so in functional reactive programming, um, there's there's this idea that all your all of your programming is um, is stateless, and then there's something else that is feeding your program uh, state. So I am I am kind of cheating by hijacking a, a buzz term, um, but in my defense, I do think these are kind of the right two terms to describe uh, the idea that I'm proposing. Um, and and so this is the this is the model that. Uh, that I am hoping to inspire um, folks who, who don't necessarily uh, have the luxury of, of uh, using Elm or, or Redux or a Flux Im implementation uh, at work. Because I, you know, I work a lot. You, you guys probably work a lot, like you know, 40 hours a week. And that's a lot of time, because we go to meetups, and then we like, learn about things, and then we go to work, and we're not doing the same thing sometimes. And, uh, and that's, that's a bummer, right? especially conferences. Man, conferences are the worst for that reason. They're the best. But they're also like, ah, uh, cool. I'm going to use this in a couple years, maybe. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so this is the model I'm, I'm, I'm trying to inspire. Uh, that um, without using without using any frameworks, we can actually uh, still be inspired by the ideas of Elm uh, in our web apps, and it's and it's super super simple. Um, uh, so if we have our JavaScript logic that is defining our, our business rules or whatever the, the purpose of the web app is, and then we keep our JavaScript effects, the things that um, are not necessarily inside of our control, like uh, like uh, HTTP requests or, or the DOM, which can be changed, right? Then um, we have some external process that knows how to combine those two, um, and and then treat the product of that as a web app. Then I think we end up um, with with ultimately simpler and more flexible designs. Um, and, and so like I said, the, uh, uh, some of the, the impetus for this talk is, um, is the fact that we can't all uh, you know, go to a stakeholder and say, I saw this talk on Elm and I thought it was really cool and we should use it, um, so let's all use it. Uh, and uh, even, if, even if you could, right? I, so um, uh, I'm, I'm leading a project now that is uh, kind of, it, it, it was created by a jQuery for life kind of, kind of developer. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, we're in charge of the project. We can change it um, to to use Elm, but I don't think that is um, I don't think that's that's a a wise kind of way to approach a project, um, or necessarily the right way for this particular project. Um, so at at Eighth Light, we're big believers in uh, the process of refactoring, right, and, and, and incrementally delivering value. And um, uh, I think that there are, are ways to write a, J a jQuery for life project um, that 
are still well designed, you know, and, and can be well maintained. Um, and and so the the the, the application, the, the applicable idea is that um, regardless of, of your front end stack, uh, the fact that you're not using Alum or you're not you're not using Redux doesn't mean you can't code towards these ideas. And so that's what I'm trying to do in this talk, kind of present the ideas that uh, in Elm that I think are super cool um, and, and inspire you to, um, to, to maybe code towards them. Um, so I don't think you need to have like a really cool virtual DOM diffing algorithm in your effect management code in order for this to derive value. Um, uh, I think that uh, the, the resulting code is, is, uh, is, is simpler. Um, so I, I, I played with the idea of kind of just ending here in the abstract. Uh, and, not, and not showing anything, because uh, I think if I, uh, so I'm going to show an example that's, 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 that's kind of like how you can, how you can uh, implement Flux without, without um, adopting a library and how you can kind of go to the, that idea in smaller steps. Um, but if, you know, if, if someone's like, oh, this talk is super cool, I'm going to go write a library that does this and then, and then show the world, then I think that's a loss because there are libraries that do this. Um, uh, Redux and, and implementations of Flux and Elm, uh, which is, uh, you know, I said those in, 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 in order of least to greatest. Um, and uh, so the, the point of, of this talk isn't that you should, you should go choose one of these things and kind of implement it. It's like, oh, it's, it's instead, how can we um, start to think about our apps, even if your, your code doesn't look like the example I'm about to present, um, there's still ways that, uh, that we can start to think about it in an incremental incremental fashion. Um, so uh, that's the last of me talking about what I'm going to talk about. Um, let's show an example and then, and then talk about some of the, uh, the benefits that, that we see in the Elm community. Um, so this is how we interact with uh, uh, effects in Elm. They're called tasks. Um, and so http.get returns, uh, returns a task. And so we uh, you, you can kind of ignore that, that JSON parameter, the first parameter to, to get. It's, it's, a, it's called a decoder in Elm. It's how we translate the raw result of the, of the JSON that, um, that the HTTP request might give us into like a record, for instance, that our, object, that our program can use. Um, uh, but, but what's important for this example is just the fact that we're going to call to the Google Calendar API, and then we're going to um, use that same or, or version of that add meetup function we talked about earlier to, so uh, task.attempt takes a task, that's what the pipe operator on the, on the far left, it's just saying the, the first, the thing before it is going to be the last argument of the thing after it, so it's really nice for stuff like this because you can describe what you're going to do and then pipe it into the next steps and say what you're going to do after. Um, so we're going to attempt the task and task takes the, attempt takes two, two parameters, one is, the, the last is the task which is the get in this example. And then add meetup is kind of what we're going to do with the result of that task. And so, um, so we do have to change the implementation slightly because tasks can fail. Um, and, and that's kind of the whole reason that, that they exist. Um, because they're external, they can fail. And so calendar is going to become a maybe calendar. We can just focus on the stuff we've seen before, which is in the blue. Um, uh, so if we, get, uh, if we get the calendar back, so if it's inside of the maybe, but it's the just, the just branch of the maybe, so it means if there's something inside it, then we'll do what we were doing before, which is append our meetup to the front of it, um, <coughs> which means prepend. Uh, and then uh, if it's not, then we'll just return the meetup as, uh, as the only thing in that list. So both, both branches of these return a list. One just adds the meetup in front, and then one uh, just returns the meetup as the entire list. Um, so uh, let's, let's begin to think about how this might look and if we just did a direct translation into JavaScript. Um, uh, so the idea, again, right, is how can we extract the, the external logic from being kind of at the center of our programs to, uh, to on the outside. And so I'll go backwards. I'll, I'll just translate add meetup first. It's, it's easy if we, uh, if we just say calc and uh, be null. And so we're either going to return the, the meetup as it is or um, a new list. Um, this is going to be our, our version of get. Um, and so uh, we, we want to return a task. And, and in Elm, uh, uh, the, the phrase that, that you might hear a lot is that tasks are just data. So tasks don't actually do the thing. 
um, when we when we say acp.get, it just describes the thing that we want to be done. And then because because we can't do anything in L, right? That's a nice way to think about it. We're we're uh, we're just you know useless function writers that we just write functions and then we hand it to Elm and Elm does all of the stuff. Um, and and so uh, oops. so task just returns data and so this in this example um, we're we're just going to return the described uh, the thing that we want to do. So the action is going to be HTTP get that's going to be unique for all the tasks we're going to write, which is just one in this example. And then data is going to be all of the stuff that this particular action needs in order for it to to do its job effectively. Um, so the Elm architecture uses the uh, init update view terminology. Um, so init is just going to be our starting model, um, and, the, and view is how we update the DOM. It's not, it's not important for this example. All that's important is that update is going, inside of update, uh, we're going to call uh, the add meetup, um, or we're going to call, um, you know, other stuff that our app does, uh, which in this case is up. Um, so then let's let's look at the effects that we're passing in. And so this is this is actually the point in our architecture where we're saying uh, so our business logic is defined in the init view update, and then the effects is going to manage how we're how we're doing the, the interaction with um, with the world. And so effects uh, just becomes this um, uh, this handler for uh, tasks. And so the, the way we decide what tasks we're going to do is, um, is that action string that we, that we attach. Uh, and then data, remember, is going to be unique for each task. And so if we just switch on the action and then delegate, um, the, the, delegate the data into uh, the implementation of the action, uh, then in there, we're just writing once uh, all of the effect managers that, that we need for our, for our app. Um, and so uh, this is nice because you you know you, you just test your HTTP request once here and in the other places you get a much more testable API because you're just returning uh, you know a regular JavaScript object um, you don't need to mock in order to know if your logic is right um, and and the task data structure if this so this one is going to be the HTTP GET it it already has in it everything that it needs to do and it, it knows everything it needs to know in order to do uh, the task that, that you've given it. So each task will contain its own um, uh, set of data, but uh, that's, that's unique to the task. And F is going to be um, our, our update function. I ran out of space, but it's going to be what's going to have stuff like add meetup. Um, and so uh, a, a reasonable question after seeing that example is why? You know, why do any of, I just introduced like three layers of indirection to your app, and I haven't motivated it. I just said it was really nice, and Elm does it. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Maybe that's enough reason for you, um, but uh, but maybe not. And so this is the uh, this is kind of the king of demos in the Elm world, which is Elm's uh, time traveling debugger, um, which is super cool. I don't know uh, how the resolution uh, looks from where you're sitting, but uh, this is actually this is a timeline of, of, of uh, values that have gone through his program, uh, and so. Uh, the developer can kind of just go back in time just by scrolling this bar, and they can change stuff in their code. That so they're changing how high Mario's jump uh, coefficient is, and Mario's jump coefficient. Like you can see what would happen if it was like that the whole time he was uh, he had that 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 value. Um, and the way this works, the reason this works, is because all of the things that are passing that are being passed through um, the the, the business logic, the stuff that's written in Elm, all of that is just is just uh, data. There's no there's no side effects stuff happening in there, and so in order to change the history, the history is just you know a log of of uh, data that, that you've provided that the the world has provided, and so you can change that pretty easily, um, and just pass it through your program again. Um, so uh, it's it's actually pretty trivial to implement it if you are using uh, even if you're using like the very simple uh, uh, flux-ish API that we just that we just described, um, which is that if we just append all of our tasks as we get them to a history, then later on uh, all we have to do is uh, read from that history. Like it, it, it's super simple because the, the instead of making the request, you you already have the um, uh, what was going to go through this function, and you can implement one of these uh, yourself. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend it, um, 
because uh, uh, the I wouldn't recommend it and say you know use this at work. That's that's the caveat, right? So if you're if you're if you're planning on uh, on introducing these ideas to work, you know definitely use uh, a more robust uh, and vetted solution um, like Elm. But uh, but the idea is that you can uh, you can start coding towards these ideas and uh, start to see benefits even if you're not doing a time traveling debugger, right? Even if you're just appending your tasks to a history, you automatically get better um, better bug reports, right? Because you can just say, uh, give me what your history looked like, and uh, I can figure out how to get to that state very easily. I don't need to necessarily click through the whole app or pretend to make these requests. Um, oh, so some other, some other things that, that, uh, that have that, uh, um, that, that debugger uh, idea is, uh, so I mentioned uh, Redux and, and Elm, but Cycle.js um, also has a, a really cool thing that, that works similarly. Um, but so I actually think that this this slide that we saw earlier, this description of your task as data, um, is is the biggest win uh, because uh, it's it suddenly if we're describing all of our tasks as data and we're just returning the value to the caller function, um, then it means that we have um, uh, it's it, so so one benefit is is referential transparency, which means that uh, any time you call the function with a certain set of arguments, it'll return that same value always. It's not dependent on other things, which means automatically you don't have to mock in order to test it. Right? If you want to force some value to come out, you just have to feed different parameters in. Um, and and what I've noticed, what the what the easiest thing to do when developing web apps is to is to keep stuff that um, is is most chaotic, like uh, like like web requests or, or updating the DOM right in the center of all of, our, of all of our business logic. We'll say if our if if, there, if it does this and this and this and this and this and this, then change the DOM, right? And uh, that's that's kind of uh, a backwards way to think about our dependencies because we want um, we don't we want to describe our, our business rules just in terms of business rules and then the DOM in terms of business rules. We don't want to describe the business rules in in, in terms of, of the DOM. We want the, the chaotic stuff to be on the outside. Of our um, of our web apps, as far as uh, dependency structure goes, and the, the the control stuff that we that we value to be on the inside, because that's the stable stuff. Um, and so the the thing I like about about this example is that uh, it gives you a, a declarative way to describe effects um, at at the middle in the in the middle parts of your program. Uh, so you can understand you can call this function see the return value and understand what it's doing um, uh, because it's just a pure JavaScript data structure. Uh, and so um, hopefully now you see uh, why I uh, maybe misleadingly named my talk Introducing Function Reactive Programming. Um, uh, and uh, if you're expecting actual FRP, maybe you'll forgive me. Um, uh, but, but the idea is that I, I think we can and, and should um, uh, define our, our business logic uh, in terms of, of stateless reactions uh, to the outside world. And, and you can kind of replace stateless there with functional and, and see where I arrived at with the title. So, so thank you, and uh, that's it. Are there cues? Questions for Kofi? Have you messed around with the immutable libraries with uh, just regular JavaScript NPM modules that are out there? Because it seems like one of the main benefits, or all the main benefits, are kind of derived from the immutability and then the benefits that that gives you as far as like tracking through changes right. that happen. Right, right, right. Um, uh, yeah, that was, that was my question. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a good observation. Uh, uh, the question was, have I messed with immutable JS and um, how do the benefits there relate to the benefits I described in my Right. So, um, so, yeah, I haven't, I haven't actually like, I haven't played with that library, okay. um, but you know, I, I played with other implementations of immutable data structures, and so, um, the, uh, the fact that you can't change anything Elm, in Elm, is is more a restriction that forces Elm to use a different language to manage effects. Um, you can you can actually use 
immutable data structures, but still have side effects in the middle of your code and, uh, and not derive some of the benefits that I talked about. Um, so uh, for instance, the, the, the ability to just replay history because your history is just data doesn't necessarily arrive, uh, derive from the fact that you're using immutable data structures. It's more that you're describing the things you want done as opposed to, to doing them in the center of your program. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. When you were talking about sort of replaying events um, and, and not having to mock out something, so let's say I, I'm making a AJAX request and fetching data from my server. Mm -hmm. So I have one uh, effect called fetch. Uh, is the other piece of that that you have a sort of like response effect that comes back with just some you know payload that's clearly described, and so then you can go back when you're replaying. You're not actually making another HTTP request, right? You're just you're replaying the reception of that response. Yep, yep, okay, yep, exactly. Cool. Thanks, Kofi. Great.